Welcome to Theology in Motion. My name is Steve Zank, and on behalf of the Center for Worship Leadership, I'm glad that you are here. Today's episode of Theology in Motion is a behind-the-scenes episode of Psalm 65, Hope Has an Answer, written by Rev. Dr. Mike Mittendorf and Kip Fox from the Psalm Library. It's a great interview with Kip and Mike. They're going to talk a bit about the theology of Psalm 65 together and the process of writing the song, A Hope Has an Answer. It's a great Christmas song. It's a great song for year-round. Hope you enjoy this interview. With no further ado, let's turn it over to Kip and Rev. Dr. Mike Mittendorf. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Kip Fox. I'm the director of the Songwriter Initiative of the Center for Worship Leadership at Concordia University, Irvine. Thanks for joining us. Today, we are going to talk about one of our releases from the Psalm Library, Psalm 65, Hope Has an Answer. I am joined by my co-writer on Psalm 65, Dr. Mike Mittendorf. Mike holds a BA in Pre-Sem Studies from Concordia University, St. Paul. He earned an MDiv, STM, and THD at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. He served as a parish pastor, a professor of religion and biblical languages, and has been on the faculty of Christ College School of Theology at Concordia University, Irvine, California for 13 years. He is the author of various books and commentaries. I could go on and on and on, but the point is, Mike is really neat. Mike, thank you for being here. Yeah, it's great to be with you, too, to talk about this song. I, uh, one of my trademarks is uh, Bible Ties, so you got me back in the Christmas mode with this song, so I got one of my favorite Christmas ties on to celebrate with you. I love it. Your tie looks great. Um, let's talk about this psalm. I had, we had a great time writing it. For, just for, the, for those listening, um, just break down what we're going to talk about here. We're going to talk about the theology of Psalm 65, then we're going to go through the process of how Mike and I wrote it, and finally we'll talk about the result of the song and how it pairs with uh, the theology that that we talk about um, to begin. So with that, let us start with the theology. Um, Mike, I've got a few questions for you. Uh, You said this psalm breaks into three parts, Psalm 65. Can you sort of take us through those three pieces? Sure. Yeah, I think the the, uh, group of psalms, I think 65 to 68, have something to do with... uh, processing or gathering for worship at Jerusalem at the temple. So you got in verse 1, a reference to Zion. Verse uh, 4, uh, your house, your holy temple. So uh, kind of a cool kind of worship-centered setting for it. Uh, I like in verse 4, it's God who chooses us, God who brings us near or draws us to himself there. Uh, But then the psalm kind of, in Hebrew at least, has kind of an odd beginning uh, it talks about silence and then about praise. So there's kind of this anticipation of waiting in silence for the opportunity to praise God. And in the first part, at least you have this confession of a God, God, you are a God, verse 2, who answers prayer. So there's that confident hope as, as you draw near to his house. Uh, verses 3 and 4, uh, we are overwhelmed by sin. So there's the part about sin removed, and that comes out uh, in your song. But just this kind of God drawing us near to him to where we gather to worship and praise him because we're confident that he draws us to himself and that he does answer our prayers because that's the God he is. That's great. Why don't we get into what happens next? So- yeah, it's cool. So I think verses 5 to 8 are, you're a God who answers us. So you've sort of got this confident looking to God uh, to do his thing, kind of. And then why, why uh, that's that's a good thing, right? You answer us how? Uh, Awesome and righteous deeds. Uh, The God, our Savior. And then I just love how this psalm kind of is all-inclusive. You had it in verse 2, all people. But then again in verse 5, you're the hope. There uh, sounds like a word we could use in a song title, the hope of all the ends of the earth. So very um, all-inclusive in uh, who this God is, who answers prayers. So there's just the affirmation. You answer us. uh, You're the hope of all people. And why? You get in verses 6 and 7 very much creation imagery. You're the God who created all things. You're the God who created all people, who gives life to all people. And because of that, uh, you're an awesome, powerful God. Verse 7, the roaring of the seas. 
uh, could uh, likely be a reference to the Exodus, which is the key salvation moment for God's Old Testament people. Uh, and uh, you settle that turmoil of the nation. So that's a relevant uh, thing for these days, too. I think it's Psalm 2, where the nations are gathered against uh, Yahweh and against his anointed one. Uh, and amidst that turmoil of nations, uh, God is one who uh, is just strong, who's life giver, who's life redeemer, and who will do wondrous things for us. And so, yeah, you got the, the creation, uh, which then becomes an all-inclusive uh, application of God. And so there are other psalms like this. Uh, Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim his handiwork. Day after day, they pour forth speech that's there for everyone. Um, so I love that uh, part of this psalm. Awesome. Okay. So we've got, we've got two parts out of three. <laughs> Take us home. Yeah, and then I think verses 9 to 13 are something um, we just don't ponder too much, that God just didn't, like some deist God, create life and then sit back on a couch. Uh, the doctrine term is providence, that he continues to provide, care for, sustain his creation. So verses 9 to 13 are just wonderful ways in which God does this. Uh, look at verse, you care for. God continues to care, not just for us, but for the land that you water it, the streams flow, uh, and just kind of this cycle of nature isn't a cycle of nature. It's God's ongoing blessing in and through creation as he provides for us, as he provides for creation. And again, other Psalms accent this, Psalm 104, 121, 136, and I like Psalm 145, that just uh, God continues to be active in his creation, and in doing so, he seeks to bless it and us with his ongoing uh, love and concern. Awesome. That's great. So we're going to get into process here in a minute. But one of the things when we talk about theology, this, this has a little bit to do with process, but also very much um, the, the approach to uh, breaking down the theology of Psalm 65. When I came to you with Psalm 65, I had already had this sort of phrase in my mind, hope has an answer. And when I sent that to you, uh, you immediately jumped on the idea of hope and specifically the word that's used in uh, verse 5, right? Um, and how that may be something that's unique or stand out. Can you tell us about that? Sure. And uh, again, these psalms are written in Hebrew, so we're going to drive back to the original text, at least to get a foundation of how you then communicate that into English words. Uh, it's interesting, probably the most wooden or literal translation of much of the scriptures is the New American Standard Bible. And uh, when you came up with hope, I looked and it doesn't use hope in verse 5. So I said, oh. But the English Standard Version, and then my go-to is still the New International Version, uh, does have hope uh, in there. And in verse 5, you answer us, you're the hope of all the ends of the earth. So what's going on underneath there is the Hebrew word batach. Uh, Hebrew is a fun language, you get to spit a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, it, it, it can be uh, not beyond, not simply the kind of hope uh, too often we hear in English. Um, and this actually, the Greek kind of secular use of hope is more just you're resigned to your fate, like I hope you have a good day, or I, I hope it's right. not too hot this summer in Phoenix, or whatever, right? right? Huh. Kind of just a wish that 50-50 at best, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the Hebrew word behind here is much more confident expectation. You know God's the creator and giver of life. You know God's the redeemer of life. So you have confident expectation, what? That he answers our prayer. So it's that kind of uh, confident assurance. So the ESV even, uh, no, the ESV and NIV translate hope, but the NASB does uh, trust, right? So this yeah. is confident expectation is the way I like to speak of it, uh, which really countered kind of at least the Greek world understanding of, of hope, which I think many Americans have, uh, and many in our world today, right? It's just uh, wishful yeah. thinking, but this is so much more because of who God is, because he answers prayer, uh, because he's powerful creator, redeemer God, we can have this confident expectation to trust, confide, 
uh, our prayers, our uh, hopes in that sense in him. Great. That's great. One last thing on theology before we get into process. Uh, we had originally set out to write something geared toward Christmas. So can you talk a little bit about how we arrived at that here and how it how Psalm 65, how you felt really that Psalm 65 uh, was able to do that? Yeah, that's great. So I, I think as Christians, we just have to read all of the Old Testament in and through Jesus. So uh, if you go to YouTube and put my name in, you get this wacky 14-minute bow tie weatherman video thing. But I think that's a good way to talk about understanding really all of the Old Testament scriptures, right, in and through Jesus. So uh, here you get uh, the creation, right, that we talked about specifically in verses 5 to 8. And the New Testament will talk about, in the beginning was the Word. God created all things through his Word, through his speaking, let there be light, and so on. And then that Word became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the incarnation. That's the Christmas message. Uh, you can also get uh, Colossians 1.17. Uh, talks about that Jesus isn't simply the creating Word of God who became human, and that we celebrate that at Christmas, but also that he holds all things together. So with verses 9 to 13 is about the ongoing care and work of God in creation to bless and sustain it and us. And so Christ is him in whom all things not only were created for him and through him, but in whom all things hold together. And then uh, finally, verse 7, I love the uh, who stilled the roaring seas, right? Mm, so yeah. if... Mark chapter 4, right? He calms the storm. Uh, I love how um, Job talks about uh, that Yahweh can tell the proud waves when to cease. Hmm. Jesus yeah. ceases the proud waves. He is the one who can still the roaring of the seas. And to the Old Testament people, the seas are always chaos. Uh, they don't venture out into it much, but God is the one who created, who controls those as well. And Jesus in his ministry uh, calming the storm and also the walking on the water episode shows that that he is uh, the one who can do those things. So obviously, in a general sense, right, all our hopes are answered in and through Jesus Christ. But I think those are some of the specific ways that uh, we see uh, Jesus uh, fulfilling or prefigured in the language of this psalm. Great, great. Um, okay. Let's let's move into the process uh, that you and I went through. Okay, so <clears throat> just a few questions here for you, uh, just to let people in on how this back and forth sort of went. So first of all, just in general, in June of 2022, I approached you about collaborating on a modern setting of a psalm. Reverend Doctor Professor Mike Mittendorf, what uh, what were your thoughts when I approached you for that? Uh, first thought is I just love the psalms. Um, they're 3,000-year-old, basically, psalm lyrics, song lyrics, and we've lost all the music. So I love how uh, this uh, superscription of this psalm is for the director of music, right? Yeah. So uh, here, take this and go with it, right? right. Here's some cool lyrics. Uh, and then uh, we always got to be careful with a psalm of David. In Hebrew, that's more literally two or four David, which could mean it's belonging to David, that he wrote it. Could mean yeah. dedicated to David, it could mean likened to David, but uh, I just love the lyrics. So we have a classic Concordia Old Testament book of the Bible where the professor gets to pick. Um, when I get yeah. to do that one, I've always picked Psalms uh, yeah. for a number of reasons. One, it's the only book that the New Testament specifically calls us to use uh, right. in Colossians and in Ephesians, sing Psalms. So it's right. calling us to use these in our ongoing worship. And so I love them. In my general education classes, I have students read two hunks of 25 psalms. And it's amazing how relevant, applicable <laughs> these lyrics are 3,000 yeah. years later, right? And students just take them to heart, uh, recognize them in worship songs they know. Um, but yeah, just still powerful, inspirational um, words of God that we can use and are actually called to use in our ongoing worship. So that's my initial uh, thing for this whole project of taking psalms and trying to, in a contemporary way, you just articulate their message in musical forms that yeah. uh, we can enjoy. That's great. Thank you. Perfect. 
Um, I learned some things there. Um, so we, we covered this a little bit, but we cut, we landed on six, Psalm 65. Uh, and, and once we had done that, I came to you just with the title or the idea of hope has an answer as, as a starting point, as a possible theme. Uh, we covered this a little bit, but, but when you saw hope has an answer as a, as a sort of, uh, encapsulation of Psalm 65, uh, what was your reaction? Uh, yeah, first to just lay out uh, the kind of the Hebrew understanding of hope, right? That even the Old Testament people of God have this confident expectation that he answers. So again, in verse 2, you're a God who answers prayer, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, verse 5, you answer us. And they knew some of his awesome deeds in creation and the Exodus and so on. Uh, but there's still always this in the Old Testament. This is not a completed story. It's kind of an almost unsatisfying ending. There has to be something better coming, even better than David and Solomon. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, this kind of longing uh, expectation fulfilled in Jesus. So it's kind of a nice yeah. Adventish kind of yeah, right. hope, uh, uh, longing, but but that in Christ and in Christmas, there's the answer, right? Yeah. That they were longing for, praying for, hoping right. for in its most uh, complete way. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it did, like you said, it, it fits really well with the, with more of a, a, a hope that is, is grounded in trust, right? We know that hope has an answer and, and uh, I hope that it, what comes out in the song is, is a sense of, of confidence in that. So, Okay. So after after some silence, right? I went into my hole there for a little bit and uh, came out with to you with a verse and a chorus, which are pretty much very very near to what ended up being the final verse and chorus. So uh, I know it's been a while, but you might have the lyrics around. Um, do you remember uh, just your thoughts on what was going on in the chorus as as it pertained to Psalm sixty five? Obvi- obviously. In some ways, you know, the verse drew very directly from some of the verses, but I also took quite a bit of creative license in the chorus. So just your overall reaction when I sent that. Uh, Yeah, just to kind of uh, marvel at, um, and we'll talk about this later uh, with a question for you, but how you can take those words and kind of put them into more modern expressions. Your, your lyrics are much shorter than the whole psalm in terms of word count, but how do you kind of encapsulate that in a poetic way in English, uh, which is not an easy thing to do. Uh, translating poetry is, is very difficult just into English, but then trying to, trying to mm-hmm. put it into lyrics uh, that yeah. make song to us are, um, uh, that's a challenge, but this is a great way of doing it. Uh, your verse one, you got God in Zion right away. The verse one of the Psalm, uh, you have heard our prayer. That's just a great, again, we talked about how this prayer is saying, you're a God who answers prayer. So answer us. And he again did in many ways in the old Testament. But uh, once I saw, yes, you know, right. Christ is the ultimate answer to that. I love how uh, the second line is for all people, right? Mm -hmm. Talked about that in the lyrics of the Psalms. Since he's creator of all, he's seeking and drawing all people to him. And then your wounded and weary uh, really goes, I think, to that verse three. We're overwhelmed by what? Well, by sins, not just our sins, right? Other people's sins. Adam and Eve's sins continue to infect creation and all of us, but you're a God who forgave our transgressions. So when we're weary, alone, afflicted, your salvation's made known. That's a great Christmas theme, like Psalm 98. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I've done some work in Romans. So I discovered there Romans 1, 16 and 17, right? Uh, That uh, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is being revealed, right? But the verse before, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. So that driving theme of Romans, the righteousness of God throughout the Old Testament, we got this Hebrew parallelism, right, which is the essence of their poetry. Righteousness and salvation are parallel to each other. So when God shows us his righteous deeds, we're saved. And Romans 1, 16, 17 picks that up, and you do that nicely as well. So then the chorus, right, we're still, not all our questions are answered, right? Right. 
Uh, we still have, because of Christ, confident expectation. So when we get those questions in the middle of the night mm -hmm. and we're praying and looking for the light, hey, that rhymes. Nice job. <laughs> um, so that this is, yeah, this is really good about the now, not yet thing. And in a sense, right. all our hopes are answered in the person and work of Christ, yeah. Christmas. But yeah. yet we're longing for his second return. So we're still struggling with sin. We're still struggling with its effects. We're still uh, looking to God for answers. And yeah. ultimately at the return of Christ, uh, all those answers will come. But again, then you reach back to in the midst of our struggles, we can have that confident trust, assurance, yeah. hope in the good sense that the right. Savior is born. He's done his work. So uh, we can uh, rely on this uh, righteousness and salvation of God. Awesome. Good. Well, one of my favorite parts about writing the song with you and, and our, our collaboration going back and forth is I sent you that verse and chorus. Um, and without even having to ask, you, you started to offer up um, more thoughts on where we could go next. And... Um, Really, this this verse two, I think, it w certainly would have never happened without us writing together, mm -hmm. um, and especially how it ties into uh, Colossians one. Right. Uh, I'd love for you to talk about um, what you brought to my attention after getting uh, verse one and chorus uh, as a possible way to go with verse two. Yeah, so it moves again then, as the psalm does in the second section we talked about, to creation, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, silencing the raging seas, which again can be literal, but for the author of this psalm and the poetry, there are a lot of raging seas around us that aren't literal water bouncing all over, but other things in our life that seem unsettled. Um, yeah, and then you drew that together from verses 6 and 7. Uh, into lyrics that uh, all things hold together by his hand. So and, as Christians... And you, had, you, had, and you had pointed me, you had pointed me specifically uh, to Colossians 1.17. And that's really where I started to, to, to form from 65 with your support on Colossians. Uh, that whole thing. Can you talk just a little bit about uh, Colossians 1.17 and why that came to your mind as, as something to throw out to me? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, probably the most extraordinary thing is who is that baby in the manger? Right. <laughs> right. Right. And well, he's an infant human being. Well, yes, he is. But at the same time, uh, Christianity confesses John one, uh, Colossians one, that he's the speaking eternal word of God became flesh. Uh, but Colossians one goes beyond that. Right. That in him, all things were created. Yes. And through him, all things hold together. That's an extraordinary thing uh, to say, that this baby in the manger is the eternal, creating, sustaining God. And so uh, he shows that in his ministry, again, calming the storm, walking on the water, uh, commanding nature, uh, that Christ is not just, you know, 2,000 years ago, Jesus but not only is he a uh, part of our lives, he continues to be active uh, as uh, God in creating, sustaining uh, the world in which we live. Great. So something comes to mind with that. I think a lot of people listening, maybe writers listening, might think, okay, we're, we're writing um, a modern psalm setting, right? We're taking Psalm 65 and we're writing our own new song to it, but we're trying to stay true to the psalm. Mm -hmm. So how is it that we have the freedom to to go around to different places in Scripture, to go to the New Testament, mm -hmm. to go to, to, to go to other other passages uh, in our in our song when we're really trying to work through Psalm 65? Does that question make sense? Yeah, yeah, sure it does. Um, so I think two things. One, on a doctrinal sense, we say Scripture interprets Scripture, right? So yeah. we can use other passages because we believe all inspired by God through the Holy Spirit um, to be his eternal, unchanging word that endures forever. Uh, but another analogy I, I really like to use is uh, I love growing roses. Um, and we could say that everything of the Godhead is there in the beginning, right? But it's yeah. kind of a bud. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And as the Old Testament goes on, it starts to open and it starts to open. And ultimate, we say, right, in these last days, God has spoken to us through his son. So in Jesus, we see most fully of this side of heaven yeah. and his return, what God is like. Now we still just know in part. Yeah. Uh, but then we will see him face to face. And uh, right. So but we know now in and through Christ more of God revealed than the psalmist did. Mm -hmm. And so we can, through Jesus, kind of fill this out. Right. How, right. how do we see that Jesus is the answer to our hopes in God yeah. and uh, in his ministry, in his miracles? Uh, and then as the New Testament in John 1 and Colossians 1 kind of stop for a minute and say, yeah, that's fine what he said and what he did and he suffered and died, he rose. But who is that person? Right. And when they fill this out for us, then we can see many places in creation, in a providence uh, yeah. that Jesus is also active uh, throughout Scripture uh, beyond his uh, earthly ministry, should we say. Awesome. Cool. Um, one la one last thing with the process here. So, this really went in a pretty linear fashion. Um, we had had um, verse, chorus, verse two, and then um, looking for that that modern song structure of of adding a bridge to the song. Um, and you had drawn my attention to uh, specifically to Psalm sixty five eight, which you had uh, tied to Isaiah seven fourteen. Uh, so I'd love for you to. Just talk about that, if you would. Uh, the Isaiah, so you're talking Emmanuel, God with us, huh? Yeah, and, yeah. and in 65.8, uh, you, you had, uh, in our email correspondence, and you may not remember this, but you had, uh, so we've got, so that the, that those who dwell at the ends, at the ends of the earth mm -hmm. are in awe, at your, on, in awe at your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. Uh. Yes, I mean, I think with the Emmanuel, right, I, I still use this old Joan Osborne song from the 1980s, what if God was one of us? <laughs> if God had a face, what would it look like? And Christianity right. says, Jesus is God with us, and his face is the face of God, right? right. So, um, uh, but then I love that uh, Jesus ministry of course initially in and around the lost sheep of israel he says but is for everybody right so mm -hmm. he's god with us for those on the farthest seas uh, and so uh christmas is one great way to proclaim his awesome deeds and uh that will amidst the uh where did we have the the uh turmoil of the nations right there you get yeah. nicely with the last line of the bridge the greatest powers of this world will be brought to their knees uh, amidst the turmoil of the nations. You know, he's the one uh, who is that God with us, who gives us confident assurance of uh, his presence in the person of Jesus, his presence in his spirit in us now, but ultimately then his return uh, when every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Those on the farthest seas will uh, bow their knee uh, and acknowledge that uh, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. That's <laughs> awesome. Great. So that was the process. Uh, just a couple more things here. First, we're going to talk about the result, basically, the finished song and, and, and how we see it playing out. But let's listen to that end result. Let's listen to Psalm 65, Hope Has an Answer. God in Zion, you have heard our prayer. Blessed are your people far and near. All you wounded, weary, and alone. Look now, I salvation is made known all of the questions that come in the night all of the hours we pray for the light every longing that wakes with the morn hope has an answer the 
Savior is born. Through Him every mountain finds its peak. Raging seas fall silent when He speaks. All things hold together by Can I just say, awesome song. Thank uh, you so much. So that shows up in that. And I wanted to talk about this earlier. Uh, your awesome deeds, right? So too often we get like the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom right. and fear the Lord. And that's not <laughs> at all in context for the people who have confident hope in God that uh, given us answers throughout time, but ultimately Jesus, that we're just say, uh, our God is an awesome God or his most awesome work was done through the frailty of his son in the manger. So I would just yeah. really like us to rethink that fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom is not being afraid of God, but it's just acknowledge him awesomeness as creator, redeemer, sustainer of life. Uh, and so you, I, I had to talk about that. Tell of your awesome deeds. Uh, yes. Yeah. An awesome work on the song. I just think so nicely kind of fits the Advent Christmas vibe, if you want to say that. Yeah, uh, that's what the kids are then, saying. Uh, yeah, and then connects us to Christ. So Great. carry on. Well, yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure to ride it with you. Do you have any questions for me? I've yeah, asked you yeah. I've asked you a bunch here, so uh, No, so, and it's helpful to other uh, songwriters. So we've got these psalms. Uh, we got the lyrics. We lost all the music, right? <laughs> and you just yeah. love to go back 3,000 years and listen to this. Um, mm -hmm. There's one episode of The Chosen uh, where they go back and have David on his throne and... The songwriter Asaph, I think, is there and says, well, we put this one together. King, what do you think of it, right? What did these sound like originally? And, and we don't know. But I think there's a genius to that of how can we then take these inspired words, inspiring words too, right? And yeah. speak them to our own day and time in and through Christ, right? Yeah. So I'm just curious how someone like you can go from this text and, and sure. then and then create modern words to speak to our own day and age now that uh, hope has answered in Christ. But how yeah. do you just fashion this into modern English poetry? <laughs> well, uh, a couple of things. Um, f first of all, um, I think it's I think at least as I have studied Luther and, and in our Lutheran heritage, uh, we are encouraged not just to, to try to take a translation word for word and set it mm -hmm. to music. But uh, Luther says that our, our plan is to follow the example of the prophets and the ancient fathers of the mm -hmm. church and to compose psalms for the people. So to me, it's 
we're we're not so much that we're called in our own place in our own time in our own vocation to follow the example of prophets to 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 create to sing new songs to the Lord especially but in a great way rooted in in scripture in the psalms um so i say that just to say there is a freedom for me as a lutheran writer of of in interpreting scripture there's a freedom for me in placing those things in my own words and trusting that God's work through the Holy Spirit, through his word, um, gives me the freedom to do, to do that. So with that said, I look at, uh, to me, for this, for this specific psalm, I mean, there are certainly uh, a few lines in here where I, I drew directly, and there are some other psalm settings that we've done for the psalm library um, where I've taken things a little bit more word for word. But um, let me pull it up quickly here. So Psalm 65, uh, 5, you know, we've talked about that a lot. We've talked about this hope has an answer thing. That's really where it all started for me. As I was, as we were reading through Psalms, deciding which one to choose, as I came across Psalm 5, uh, 65, 5 here, by awesome deeds, your answer, you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. Uh, for some reason, just meditating on that here, mm. the idea hope has an answer came to me. And not only did it th- that sort of strike me as, as a, c- certainly a lyrical idea, but as a very good end to a chorus, mm. right? Um, so I felt that everything that, that, that really everything was encapsulated in that idea. Um, and so I could draw from the rest of the psalm in the rest of our song, uh, leading to that point. So it's always mm-hmm. the best, the best way to start. And not, I usually don't, not usually, but I don't always, um, luck out with starting with the chorus idea, but that's usually the best way to start is if you can start with a concept, a lyrical concept that is a great chorus concept, it's a great place to be able to start from. A lot of times you start a song and you're writing and writing and then you're like, okay, what do I say for the chorus? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but to be able to to come to this song with, with the confidence that came from working with you and, and your interpretation and your exegesis of what was going on, um, I was able to just start with Hope Has an Answer and then draw out the rest of the psalm from there. So I guess I hope that kind of answers your question. But uh, I, with the chorus there, I really wanted to... Um, I wanted this song to give hope to to the entire world, right? We talked about to the ends of the earth, on the farthest seas. I didn't want this just to be for Christians, but for anyone listening, especially I think I had the thought that at Christmas time, right, we have the ear of many more people, pretty much of any time of year, we have the ear of folks with Christmas songs. So I felt that if we were going to write uh, something geared toward Advent and Christmas, uh, there was going to be a broader audience. And so I could write this chorus to reach out to anybody uh, to say, look, all of this all of this pain you go through, all of these questions mm-hmm. that come in the night, right? There is an answer. So it's, uh, it's proclaiming uh, the good news to believers for sure, but also proclaiming in a way mm-hmm. the good news to, to those who don't know. Yeah, yeah, I think of uh, three quick things. One, uh, that freedom you have as a songwriter to take and fashion these words of scripture. I think uh, you did an MA thesis here at Concordia, which <laughs> kind of lays out, right, the Lutheran yeah. way of dealing with beauty and music and uh, how that's uh, very much in his vein of the worship life of God's New Testament people, right? Right. Uh, that with his freedom in Christ to do those things. Uh, yeah, I love what you said there just at the end, right? I mean, not only Christians got all these questions in the night. I have them. Um, you know, we, we're praying, we're hoping, we're longing. So that beautifully picks up. And, uh, you know, the King David actually in Hebrew played the Kenor, yeah. which the Septuagint translated into Quitar. Ah. So as soon as I heard that picking guitar part, right, yeah. that's very catchy right away. And that kind of runs the rhythm of the whole thing. But that just fit the lyrics so well. So way to go, quitar players in the yes. line of King David. <laughs> well, that is that is that inspires me to to keep playing the guitar. It also inspires me to perhaps pick up one of those keytars uh, that yeah. are the keyboard with the guitar too. I mean, it's 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 in there, right? It's that's yeah. what David did. 
That's awesome. Well, I think that's a great way to end. Uh, thank you, Mike. It, it was a pleasure writing this song with you. I hope we get to do it again. Um, and I hope folks like the tune. Y'all can listen to Psalm 65 anywhere uh, that uh, music is streaming. Uh, the artist is called The Psalm Library, and the song is called Psalm 65, Hope Has an Answer. Be sure to follow us on Spotify. The Psalm Library is a part of the Center for Worship Leadership, which you can follow us on Instagram at CWL underscore CUI. Uh, that's about as many promos as I can give. All right. Thanks, Mike. We'll talk You're to you very soon. You're welcome.